Okay, so we're going to start this morning, and we're going to talk about pediatric thoracic trauma, okay? Now, the, the nice thing about this lecture, it's, it's pretty specific in, in its topic, but it touches on a lot of interesting things, and I think a lot of things that you can pull into your practice that you'll be able to take to other types of um, situations, other trauma, or even in terms of, um, you know, transferring patients in general, pediatric patients, abdominal pain, things like that, and we'll kind of highlight that stuff. So trauma is uh, the leading cause of death in pediatrics. Now, thoracic trauma accounts for less than 10% of these cases. But the reason why we're talking about it is mortality can be high. And in fact, mortality can be about 25%. And if you involve the major blood vessels um, or the heart, it can go up to about 50%. So this is why this is such an important topic we wanted to talk about. So 82% of patients who have thoracic trauma can have um, multi-system injuries. And that makes sense, right? Because um, you basically, you're, you're protected here. You have a cage around you. So if you have damage enough to, you know, if you have trauma enough to do damage here, then you definitely have to worry about other areas, right? Like your abdomen that's less protected. So most common mechanisms of injury here are things like motor vehicle accidents, pedestrian struct, uh, arm assault. These are things that we see not infrequently. And then common injuries, things that we see are pneumothorax, hemothorax. We see pulmonary contusions, rib fractures. This is kind of bread and butter in this topic. So um, the first question that we're going to talk about here is should we be transferring out pediatric trauma? Right? This is an important question. And what Abstract 2 talks about, um, it asks, do kids do better at trauma centers? And it was a retrospective study. It looked at about 175,000 children. So a lot of these studies are going to be talking about big numbers because they uh, mine data from large databases. And they compared in-hospital mortality at adult, pediatric, and mixed trauma centers. And what they found is that at adult centers, the mortality was about 2.3%. Now, that goes down at mixed, it's about 1.8%, and that at pediatric centers, it's 0.6%. So you can see that kids are doing worse at places that mostly treat adults. The thing is, the, it was the youngest patients that did the worst, so it's the kids less than five years old, okay? I mean, and that makes sense, right? The, the closer the kid gets to looking like an adult, right, the more comfortable we may be at treating them. So it's the little ones that are, are the most challenging. And in fact, they had the higher mortality had an odds ratio of about 1.8. So, you know, what we're saying there is we're saying that the odds of dying are almost two times higher if you're taking to an adult trauma center versus a pediatric trauma center, okay? And that's especially if you're less than five years old. So keep in mind when seeing pediatric trauma, okay? And we're going to kind of see this theme throughout this lecture about, you know, kids doing better at places that focus on children. All right, so then the next question here says, are there other benefits to transfer? So abstract three says, do children get more total radiation at non-pediatric hospitals? What do you guys think? Into it, yeah, of course, right? Um, so they compared radiation levels of transferred children to pediatric trauma centers, and these are 500 children um, that had about 1,000 CT scans. And, you know, in general, right, CT scanning is rampant. It gives us a lot of information. It makes us more comfortable in terms of our disposition. Um, but CT radiation can increase cancer risk in children about two to three-fold. Okay, so these are, these are serious risks. And efforts to decrease pediatric radiation have been around for 15 years. They've been working on this quite a bit, right? We have lots of data for it, and we're going to talk about some of it. And um, the newer CT scans, they're faster. Pediatric centers have pediatric protocols. How many of you guys have low-dose um, radiation pediatric protocols at your hospitals? Okay, a few. How many of you guys work at uh, centers that see peds? A lot of peds, like mixed centers. Okay, anybody work at like solo pediatric centers? Okay, so we have mostly adult and mixed here. So this, this lecture in terms of transferring is, gonna, is very relevant. Okay. So what they found here is that radiation doses were twice as high at non-pediatric centers, 
okay? And this is, they compared, it was like 3.8 uh, millisieverts versus 1.6. But the point is that kids are getting more radiation at adult centers. So the next abstract compares um, total CT scans done. Okay, so now we know that you get more radiation at adult centers, but who's doing more scans? So this one looked at about 60,000 kids, and they compared CT rates at adult, pediatric, and mixed trauma centers. And they found that the rates were highest at the adult and the mixed centers. And they concluded here, so this is an important number, that for every 100,000 kids that are seen at adult and mixed centers instead of pediatric, there would be an additional 16 to 17 lifetime cancers. And that's huge, right? I and mean, think about that if that's, your, if that's your kid, if that's your family member, right? 16 to 17. You think, you know, 100,000, that's a lot, but it's not, it's really not that much if we think about, you know, that nationally. All right, so next question says, how should we be transferring out these patients? Um, so we have two choices, helicopter versus ground, okay? People think that if I do a helicopter, these kids are going to get the care they needed faster, right? They're going to get better faster, and they're going to get what they need. And so this, this study looked at that. So it looked at 14,000 kids, um, and about 4,000 of them got transferred by helicopter. So half of the kids had an ISS score less than 10. So what that means is these kids are not that sick, okay? And, and of these kids, most of them were, trans, were discharged in under a day, right? So they're getting transferred by helicopter, they're not that sick, and then they're getting trans, uh, discharged anyway. And what they found between the two groups is that there were no significant differences. There were no differences in discharge disposition, ICU length of stay, and survival. So the take home here is that helicopter transport is not changing outcomes and it's not helping, right? So unless you're at a rural, faci you know, rural facility with really no other means of getting to a, um, a location in a reasonable, a reasonable time, ambulance ground transfer is just as good. Okay, so now we've decided that we're going to transfer the kid, right? Because we're like, the kids do better, we know that the mortality is better, they get scanned less at um, pediatric centers, so we're going to do that, okay? And now we decided, all right, we're going to transfer them by ground. We've decided that too. So the question is, should we do imaging before transferring these, these kids? And that's what this next uh, question looks at. So abstract six asks, to CT or not to CT. And there are many regional state ATLS guidelines that recommend against imaging prior to transfer. And in fact, there's a principle, it's called the ALARA principle, and this means as low as reasonably achievable. And this is based on the principle that there's no safe dose of radiation, okay? And it's not like, eh, a little bit, it's not that bad, right? It's based on the principle that like, none is better, okay? And that every little bit can potentially be harmful. Okay, so this study, um, it, they looked at about 1,500 children transferred over a 10-year period from 2000 to 2010, and 70% of them had imaging prior to transfer. Okay, so most were head and abdominal CT scans. Now, ready for this. 18% had to have repeat imaging, right? And these are imaging for all sorts of reasons. They could be imaging because, you know, the image was poor quality, they didn't get contrast that they were supposed to get, they never sent the imaging, right? But almost 20% of these kids are getting re-imaged. And, you know, I think the take-home here is that you should coordinate with the accepting facility, okay? Make sure you have a conversation and you can tell them, you know, I'd prefer to defer the imaging here, you know, let you guys take care of it, that way you'll get what you need and, you know, you can get it with the same protocols that you do for kids. So, you know, we need to stop scanning, okay? The next abstract seven looks at how did Massachusetts do with this? Okay, so we already know that the guidelines say don't scan, and how did they do? So this one, um, it's a 2014 study, and it looked at 260 injured kids transferred to pediatric centers. And um, the Massachusetts triage guidelines recommend stabilization and transfer without CT. So these are their guidelines. This is what they're supposed to be doing. So how did they do? Well, let's see. 65% received scans prior to transfer. So that actually was pretty consistent with that other study, right, which is about 70%. So the majority of these kids are getting um, scanned. 
So 50% of these um, scans were performed in kids less than 10, right? And we remember that the younger the kids are when they're getting irradiated, right, the more potential years they have to develop cancer, okay? And that's why, you know, when we have a 90-year-old, we're like, CT, sure, right? But when we have a 9-year-old, we think differently about that. So half of the scans that they did were negative, completely normal. And again, a quarter of these scans had to be repeated, okay? And 50% of the scans were of the head, and a third of those had to be repeated. So, you know, we're seeing over and over again um, the fact here of don't scan these kids, right? Because, I, I, you know, we think we're helping somehow, helping to make the diagnosis, hoping they're going to get where they need to go, but it turns out it's not doing that, and these kids are just getting more and more radiation, okay? So hold off on that before you send them. Question. Yes? Yeah, the question was why do they rescan so much? And again, the reasons why they rescan are because either imaging is not being sent, right? The imaging is poor quality, or they didn't have contrast, but they needed contrast. So, you know, there's lots of reasons we think we're doing, we're like, we'll just do a quick scan, you know, not worry about the contrast, don't have to get an IV in the kid, and it doesn't give them the information that they need. Yes? Right. And, you know, I mean, there, there are studies that look at it and, you know, it, it turns out it doesn't really change the management. It doesn't improve their mortality. It's not improving their outcomes. And so it's not helping in the way we want to help them. So, you know, we think we're doing it, but we're not. And we're going to talk about things that we can do if we feel like we need to do something. But putting them through the, the scanner, right, the, the tube of truth is not the way to do it. Okay, so the next section here, the question says, what is the role of chest x-ray in the initial evaluation of trauma? All right, so we're, we decided, okay, we're not going to CT them. Well, what should we do? Should we, should we do a chest x-ray? Okay. Well, abstract eight looks at chest x-ray as a screening tool. And it, um, it basically evaluated that as a screening tool prior to uh, CT. And this was chart review. And what they found is that 40% had significant trauma and this is hemothorax, uh, pneumothorax, flail chest, uh, mediastinal or vascular injuries, okay? So 40% had significant trauma and 41% got CT scans, okay? Of the 41% that had CTs, nine significant traumas were found that were not seen on the chest x-ray, but none of these had intervention, okay? So basically what they're saying here is that chest x-ray got most of that. Um, so their take home here is that they're saying if no significant finding was seen on chest x-ray, you don't need the CT scan, okay? So if you use it as a screening tool and you see nothing, you could be reassured. Because even if you're missing a tiny, tiny little, you know, apical pneumothorax or something like that, you know, these are the kids that aren't going to get interventions for it. Okay, so abstract nine talks about the need for a CT scan based on the chest x-ray and the mechanism of injury, okay? And so they ask, can mechanism and chest x-ray predict who has significant um, trauma independent of the CT scan? And so this was a retrospective review of 3,000 blunt trauma patients, pediatric patients, okay? About 1,500 of them had chest x-rays. 930 had thoracic CT scans, and about 570 had both. And what they found is that CT changed management in 17 patients. That's about 0.5%, okay? So pretty small. Um, and all changes were predicted by the mechanism and the abnormal chest x-ray findings. So of these kids, two had operations, one had a stent, one were, were medically managed, and four ha ended up having negative workups. Okay, and so what they recommended here is they recommended reserving thoracic CTs if you had an abnormal chest x-ray and a severe mechanism of injury, right? Because they found that both of those were good predictors. Okay, so next one then, when should a chest CT scan be obtained? So why do we CT? What are we worried about? What don't we want to miss? Right, yeah, we don't want to miss aortic injuries, okay? That's, that's the scary thing, right? That's why we're really, we're really concerned about this. So, you know, this paper, um, paper 10, 
um, claims that the incidence of this of, is so low that it may not be worth it, may not be worth radiating all these kids. So this looked at 300,000 kids that were admitted to pediatric hospitals with traumatic injuries. So 0.02% of these had thoracic injuries, and 40% had CT scans. Okay? That's a lot of CTs for a very small amount of injuries. And so what they estimated is that for every 10,000 CT scans, the cancer risk is 25 girls developing it and 7 and a half boys. Okay? So in this cohort, that would be around 300 girls and 90 boys developing cancer, okay, just from these CT scans. So the take home of this article is don't perform screening CTs, okay? You can, you can do a screening chest x-ray, very reasonable, okay, and then look for mechanism of injury, and that can help you decide. And, you know, again, if your patient is stable and you're not in a pediatric center, you want to transfer these patients, right? And, and they can decide if they need to CT or not. Okay, so next question, every paper is going to have this. Is there a role from ultrasound, right? It's like, if you have an ultrasound and you have a body, right, you can do something with it, okay? And how many of us are, feel comfortable with ultrasound? Okay, how many of you guys are using it routinely in your practice? Okay. And, you know, this is, this is something, this is a question that we ask kind of every year, right? And early on you see, like, one hand, a couple hands, and now and now it's becoming more and more popular. If you're not comfortable, you know, with it, find somebody in your practice that is and do some scans with them, you know, get, get familiar. There's courses you can take as well. But this is an important tool, right? Because we're saving radiation and it can give us a lot of information. All right, so what about kids? So um, Abstract 11, this is a 2017 review article, and they point out that there's not much data on point-of-care ultrasound and pediatric trauma. And this is kind of, so, so they, they talk a little bit more, but they extrapolate from adult literature, and they suggest ultrasound is a useful first-line tool because they say you can identify um, a pericardial effusion or a pl uh, pleural effusion. So if you feel like you have to do something, grab the ultrasound, do that, right? Totally reasonable. All right, so let's talk about fast exam for a minute. So this next, the next two articles here, Abstract 12 talks, asks, does fast decrease the likelihood of obtaining a CT scan? So this looked at 6,500 stable kids with blunt torso trauma. 6% of these had an um, intra-abdominal injury. 50% of these kids had an abdominal CT scan and 14% had a fast um, performed prior to getting the CT. And they state here that the use of fast increased as clinical suspicion for an intra-abdominal injury increased. I mean, this makes sense, right? You're worried that um, somebody has an injury, so you grab it, you wanna see if there's any free fluid or something like that, right? So and the sicker the kid is, the more worried you are, and the faster you want the information. So the authors claim here that if the clinician had a low suspicion for an intra-abdominal injury, the patient had less chance of getting a CT scan if the FAST exam was done first. Okay, and you know, they say that if they had um, a suspicion like 1 to 5%, they broke it down like less than 1%, 1 to 5%, 6 to 10%. So um, the relative risk here was around 0 0.8, 0 0.85, okay? And, um, it was not significant if the suspicion was less than one or greater than 10%. Meaning, if you weren't worried at all about the kid, right, you're not CTing them anyway, it doesn't matter what the, the fast showed. And if you're really, really worried, it also didn't matter because you're getting the CT scan no matter what. So, okay. The next one here asks, would doing a fast exam in pediatric trauma reduce CT scan use? So this one was randomized, it was non-blinded, um, and they looked about at uh, around 1,000 hemodynamically stable kids that had acute blunt torso trauma. These kids also had a significant mechanism of injury or decreased loss of consciousness. And they, had a, they were suspected of having at least a 5% risk of an intra-abdominal injury. So half had a fast exam, okay, and half, half had standard of care. And what they found is they found no significant difference here. So there was no difference in the incidence of CT scanning. About, you know, 50% of each group had CT scans. Um, 
there were no missed abdominal, uh, intra-abdominal injuries, no difference in that, um, no difference in laparotomies, ED length of stay, hospitalization, or charges. They were about the same, right? Which makes sense if you're getting the same workup, the same hospitalization, the same CT scans, you know, this would be expected. So what they found, they, they're, you know, their take home here is while the fast decreased the physician's suspicion for an intra-abdominal injury, it didn't really translate to outcomes. Yes. Right. Okay, so the point that this gentleman was making is he was saying, you know, he works at a trauma center and they use the FAST exam to determine if you need to go straight to the OR or not, right? And, you know, I think that that's reasonable. If you see a belly full of blood, you're going to go to the operating room. Although, you know, where I used to work, they'd be like, all right, put them through the scanner real quick on the way to the OR, you know? I don't know if, I don't know if they're doing that where you are, but, um, right. And, you know, I, you know I, I think that that's a very reasonable way to use it. Here they were trying to see if it in any way dictates whether or not you're going to get a CAT scan. And it looks like, for the majority, not really. Okay? doesn't look like it's translating that much to kids. In adults, it looks like it does. Okay? If you see no free fluid in an adult, you know, the clinician's like, okay, we can hold off. If they do, then they can get the scan. But in kids, it doesn't seem like that's really panning out. All right. So what about clinical decision tools? Okay, we don't like to call them rules, right? We like to call them tools because they can help us, but they shouldn't necessarily, you know, definitively decide for us what we have to do. So abstract 14 um, asks, what about a decision tool to help identify thoracic injuries and trauma? They looked at uh, about 1,000 kids, and 8% had thoracic injuries. And these were, again, your pneumothorax, your hemothorax, um, you had some pneumomediastinum, sternal fractures, aortic injuries, so a whole bunch of different stuff here, right? Some contusions. And what they did is they tried to generate a clinical decision tool based on physical findings, right? Meaning, like, you walk in, you assess the patient, and now we decide what, what the next steps are. So what they found is that they're predictors of thoracic injury. And I'm going to give you some of the odds ratios here. And the odds ratios, remember, it, it, it helps you understand the increased risk of all these things. Okay. So if you had an abnormal chest auscultation, you had an odds ratio of 8.6. Okay. So that's significant. That makes sense, right? If you hear something different, you know, if you have decreased breath sounds on one side, probably a pneumothorax there. Right? So it makes sense that that's so high. If you were hypotensive, okay, that was about uh, four and a half. If you had an abnormal thoracic exam, about three and a half. Um, if your GCS was less than 15, okay, that was another predictor. If you had an elevated respiratory rate, and if you had a femur fracture, okay, because if you had a femur fracture, um, then, the, you know, obviously the mechanism was enough that, you, that there's higher concern for this. And what they found is that 98% of the 80 patients with thoracic injury had at least one of these predictive factors, okay? There were 37% of kids that had none of these factors, and of those, two had thoracic injuries, okay? But none of these required interventions. It's pretty good. It's not too bad. Okay, so that seems promising. All right, so next question, what about identification of associated injuries? So this abstract asks, is there a tool to help determine who is at risk for multi-system trauma? All right, we already talked about multi-system trauma, you know, being, you know, north of 85%, right? And so which of these kids have it and how far down the rabbit hole do we have to go to find it? So the problem is, right, because of this, it leads to pan scanning, right? Basically, like, scan head to toe, see what's wrong, and that'll give us the most information. But as we know... You know, this increases risk of downstream cancer in these kids, and we don't want to do that if we don't have to do that. So this was a prospective study, and this comes from PCARN. Um, 12,000 kids with blunt thoracic trauma. And their goal was to derive a prediction tool to identify kids at low risk for intra-abdominal injuries requiring intervention to help spare CT scans. Okay, and they had a seven-item prediction tool. So this included a GCS less than 14, and what I want to point out here is a lot of these prediction tools, they're common sense things, right? They're things that if we saw any of these things, we'd be like, whoa, like that's concerning, 
right? They just happen to put it in a list for them. But just think about that as you hear it. So GCS lesson 14, vomiting, abdominal pain, abdominal tenderness, a seatbelt sign, or other evidence of abdominal wall trauma, decreased breast sounds, and evidence of thoracic wall trauma. And what they found is that it had a sensitivity of about 97%. Specificity is about like 43, okay? And the negative predictive value was 99.9%. .9%. And so, you know, what they point out here is that this requires validation, but it may prove a useful tool to help decrease unnecessary radiation, right? Because if you don't have any of these things, the chance that you have an abdominal um, injury is low, and you probably don't need to be CT scanned. Okay, so then the next abstract here talks about clinical suspicion versus clinical prediction tools, right? And this is where we kind of come full circle, right? We're like, well, we should create these things because they're clinical, gestalt isn't that good. And we create all these things, and then we're like, well, let's now compare it back to how we did in the first place. So this looked at the clinical prediction tool um, that was created in abstract 15, so the one that we just talked about. And this was a secondary analysis of 12,000 kids. And the intra-abdominal injuries requiring intervention in this group was about 1.7%. So physicians documented clinical suspicion for intra-abdominal injury requiring intervention prior to CT scan. How concerned they were. They wrote this down. So um, they thought it was less than 5%, about 93% of the time. So the majority, you know, they, they, they had a very low suspicion for it. So even though they had a low suspicion of it, they ordered CT scans in a third of these patients, right? They're like, meh, I'm not that worried. You know what, let's scan them anyway, right? So, and then they compared this to the clinical prediction tool. So they found that the prediction uh, tool was 15% more sensitive than clinical suspicion, but less specific. So, um, and in terms of sensitivity, the prediction rule was about 97% versus 83%. Okay, and the prediction rule was less specific. Again, we said 43 versus about 80% um, for the clinician. But what the authors suggest here is that by using this tool, you can reduce unnecessary abdominal CT scans in children with blunt thoracic trauma. So something to consider, right? Okay, and then the last abstract we're going to talk about here, this is an important one, is this abstract 17. Okay, and this question says, should we include family members in trauma resuscitations? So what do you guys think? How many of you guys are letting family stay in the room? Okay. I let family stay in the room for everything, okay? I let family stay in the room for, you know, if, you know, kid needs an LP, suture, I mean, you name it. I want family to be there because if the kid is awake, okay, and the kid is uh, alert, having a family member there can be really reassuring. And this is what this look, looked at. So ASEP and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that family be present in all aspects of emergency care. So this seems to be along the lines of what you guys are doing, which is great. Um, I mean, this is already accepted practice in adults, right? How many of you guys are letting family members stay, you know, even in, like, codes, right? It makes a difference. I think it makes a, a big difference. Parents, you know... Um, Family members know that you're doing everything that, that um, you can do for their kids and I think, or their family members, and I think that's really important to see that. So what they did here is they interviewed family members of children undergoing trauma resuscitation, and 90% felt being there helped them understand their child's condition. Okay? It also decreased their own anxiety, and they felt it decreased their child's anxiety. And 100% of them felt it was important to be there, and they would do it again. So if they were there, they were like, it was important, I want to be there, I'm going to do it again. And um, only 30% of them felt um, it affected the way that their trauma team cared for their child, right? So it wasn't that they were being obtrusive, they don't think that they were in any way dictating care, but they felt like they were being there. And so the take home here is that it's really important, okay, to let them be there and let them support their family members, let them support their kids, Okay, and it'll help the kids and it'll help the parents. And I think then it ends up helping you too.